Hello everyone. This presentation was prepared for medical students, for people who know very little about hair and usually they know nothing about trichoscopy. So if you feel that this is interesting for you, please join me. This is a hair, a hair shaft and a hair follicle. And if we have a patient coming in with hair loss, in the great majority of cases, this will be a disease of the hair follicle. And what is the hair follicle? The hair follicle is a very complex structure which is not alone in the universe. It is surrounded by multiple factors such as hormones, the cytokines, but also there are multiple blood vessels around the hair follicle. So basically, any soluble component of the blood will influence the hair growth in the hair follicle. Basically, any substance which is in the blood may influence the growth of the hair. And so multiple diseases may cause hair loss. And this is just a short list of groups of diseases which may be the cause of hair loss. And when we try to diagnose a patient with hair loss, we may have some problems. What do we start with? Let's imagine this is our patient. He comes with hair loss, you are the doctor. You have to keep in mind every possible cause of hair loss and there are hundreds of them. So what do you start with? Yes, you start with trichoscopy. Trichoscopy is a diagnostic procedure which is designed for diagnosing the cause of hair loss. However, there are many cases in which trichoscopy will not give the final answer about the diagnosis, but it will give a hint of what to look for. So for example, if you see features of lupus in trichoscopy, of course, you will not make the diagnosis of lupus with this uh, procedure. You will go on with making an examination for antinuclear antibodies and for fulfilling other classification criteria of systemic lupus erythematosus. And then you can identify hair loss which is related to lupus. And if you see features with androgenic alopecia, you will go on with further examinations. The same applies for lichen planar pilaris. You will then look at the anogenital area and at the oral mucous membranes and other areas which may be affected. If you see features of tinea capitis, you will perform a mycological culture. And if you believe based on trichoscopy that the cause of hair loss are scalp metastasis, then you'll perform histology and go on with the oncological investigation. What is trichoscopy? Trichoscopy is a diagnostic procedure which is designed for diagnosing hair and scalp disorders. It is a method based on hair and scalp dermoscopy. The term was introduced some years ago by a group and I'm happy to be part of this group. Trichoscopy can be performed with any handheld dermoscope, but also we can use the digital dermoscopes. They are best for experts, for people who want to keep the photographs, for people who prefer a bigger magnification. So they are very useful if you are a doctor who is taking care of patients with hair loss. In trichoscopy, we evaluate different structures such as the hair shafts, the follicular openings, the skin surface elements, and the blood vessels. A normal hair shaft is uniform in shape and in color. There are multiple hair shaft abnormalities. I will just name a few of them or maybe just three of them. The first one are the exclamation mark hairs. They look like an exclamation mark because they are thick at the distal part and thin at the base. And the exclamation mark hairs are most typical for alopecia areata. The second type of abnormality are the comma hairs. The comma hairs are shaped like a comma or like a C, and this is an example. And the comma hairs are typical for tinea capitis. And the third abnormality are the flame hairs. The flame hairs are a feature which is associated with trichotillomania. So now let's go back to our patient. The patient comes in with hair loss. We use our dermoscope to look at the scalp, and this is what we see. Does it look like flame hairs? No. Does it look like comma hairs? No. But 
Does it look like exclamation mark here? Yes. So our first thought would be that this is most probably alopecia areata, and we will go on with diagnosing in the direction of alopecia areata. A second most frequent structure which we evaluate are the dots. What are the dots? Let's see. If you imagine again that this is a hair shaft and a hair follicle, and if there is loss of hairs, then what will be left will be empty hair follicles or hair follicles which are filled with the residue of the hair. So when you look at the skin from the perspective of a dermoscope, what you will see are the dots. And I will show you today two types of dots. These are the yellow dots and the black dots. Both the yellow dots and the black dots are very common in alopecia areata, but they both may be also present in other diseases which cause hair loss. Another feature which we look at is the scaling or the skin surface. And we can distinguish two types of scaling. This is the diffuse scaling. We will find it in the psoriasis and seborrheic dermatitis, in discoitupus dermatosus, in contact dermatitis, and many other disorders. And the perifollicular scaling. The perifollicular scaling we will see very commonly in lichen planar pilaris and in frontal fibrosing alopecia, also in folliculitis decalvans, but also in some other diseases. So uh, these are two different types of scaling which may give some information about the subtypes of diseases. Another type of abnormality which we often observe is the abnormality in the blood vessels. I will show you today examples of blood vessel abnormalities. This image shows a spider-like arrangement of arborizing vessels which look like superimposed on a yellow dot and this structure was called by us the red spider on the yellow dot and this is a feature which is associated with the late atrophic phase of discoid lupus erythematosus. Another example is the perifollicular arrangement of elongated blood vessels and this will be seen mainly in patients with cicatricial alopecia. And a third example, this is the intrafollicular arrangement of blood vessels, and this image shows an example of psoriasis. So what I was showing until now, these were clues. What are clues? These are pieces of evidence which may lead toward a solution of a problem. This means if we see these features in trichoscopy, this may lead us to the diagnosis, but this is by itself not the diagnosis. Moving slowly to the diagnosis, when you take a look at these patients, you may have the impression that they have a similar type of disease. But in fact, in every patient, the trichoscopy image will be different. And these are patients with nine different causes of hair loss, which require nine different approaches in therapy. I will focus on three of these diseases. When you take a look at these three patients, these are patients of mine who have a focal hair loss, very similar clinically. However, when we take a look at trichoscopy, trichoscopy shows different features. In the first upper image, you will see the exclamation mark hairs, which you already heard about today, and they are typical for alopecia areata. So we will search for other features of alopecia areata. The second image shows the flame hairs, and they are typical of trichotillomania. And the third case, here we see in trichoscopy the coma hairs, and he will, here we will perform a mycological culture to investigate for tinea capitis. How can we combine the trichoscopy with the clinical practice and how does it work in real life? I will show you today a few examples of how trichoscopy can be useful in clinical practice. This is a five-year-old boy and he had areas of sparse hair, thin hair since infancy. And we performed trichoscopy and we were surprised to see that the patient had multiple gray hairs. We would not be surprised to see gray hair in a person who is 50, 60 or more. But gray hair among normal pigmented hair in a five-year-old boy was quite unusual. So what came to our mind was the possibility of ectodermal dysplasia. 
And because in external dysplasia, one of the very common abnormalities and the easiest to investigate are problems with the teeth, the cone-shaped teeth, we ask the patient to show the teeth. And then the mother, the parents were reluctant because they were saying, doctor, you are a dermatologist, please just take care of the hair. And uh, we have a dentist and the dentist is taking care of the teeth. And this is one of the problems we very often see in our patients who have syndromes which are associated with multiple interdisciplinary abnormalities because every doctor is taking care of one part of the disease and there's no doctor who, who will take a look at all the features and take a look in an interdisciplinary way at the patient. So this type of disease requires a very interdisciplinary knowledge from the dermatologist. So yes, we asked the patient to show the teeth. And we were not surprised to see the typical cone-shaped teeth, typical for epidermal dysplasia, and also abnormalities in the nail plate, which would not be typical for a five-year-old. Just as a reminder, what is epidermal dysplasia? This is a group of more than 200 diseases these are genetic diseases which are characterized with the abnormalities in the ectodermal tissues and most commonly these are abnormalities in the hair, in the teeth, in the nails, sometimes in the sweet glands and I will be talking about this in a moment, but also sometimes in other tissues which are of ectodermal origin. And there are two subgroups of uh, ectodermal dysplasia the hypohydrotic type and the hydrotic type. The hypohydrotic type is associated with the inability of the child to sweat and this may lead to hyperthermia, what is a life-threatening condition. So here with trichoscopy we may identify a disease which is life-threatening and it is important to have this knowledge to prevent the consequences of hyperthermia in these patients. One more patient. This is a patient who came in with some red lesions, which would not look very suspicious, but we looked at trichoscopy and we saw multiple round orange areas. And this led us to the suspicion of sarcoidosis. So we performed the x-ray, the chest x-ray, and yes, the diagnosis in this patient was sarcoidosis, and she was referred to the pulmonologist for further investigation. Another patient in our dermatologist's office who came in with hair loss. This is a 23-year-old woman. She visited our department with a history of hair loss, some itch, and she was saying that at the beginning she was not really worried with the hair loss because uh, her friends also had episodes of similar conditions and they were saying that it resolves spontaneously with no extra treatment. So she was using some vitamins from TV commercials and was waiting for the improvement. But as the disease progressed, she started to search for a dermatologist. When she visited our office, the first thing what we did was, of course, trichoscopy. We were a little bit surprised because clinically she may have been looking like androgenic alopecia, but this was not the case. She had no hair shaft thickness heterogeneity, so she had no androgenic alopecia. She had some features of telogen effluvium, such as multiple units with only one hair, but what especially caught our attention was the presence of the blood vessels, which were clearly abnormal. And this made us think that this may be a case of systemic lupus erythematosus. We started looking whether the patient fulfills the classification criteria for lupus, and we also performed some blood and some urine tests. And yes, the patient had proteinuria, she had low white blood cells, and she was positive for antinuclear antibodies. So based on the criteria, we were able to make the diagnosis of systemic lupus erythematosus, a case of systemic lupus erythematosus in which the disease started with the hair loss and in which we would not make the diagnosis if we would not have performed trichoscopy. And now two cases from our office, which are in a way similar, so I will be showing them together. These are images of alopecia in two women who are around 50 years old. In the left image, you see a focal alopecia of a few week history, 
And this may look like alopecia areata clinically, and in the right image, we see an alopecia uh, subtype, which may look like cicatricial alopecia. It has a history of few years. However, what is surprising in both these cases, trichoscopy is very similar. It shows yellow dots, black dots, and the presence of thick arborizing vessels. And also in the other image, in the other patient, yellow dots, black dots, and thick arborizing vessels. And based on these features, we suspected breast cancer metastasis, and they were confirmed by histology. I showed a few examples of how trichoscopy can be useful in clinical practice. However, I have one most important take-home message for you. This is that there are no hair shaft diseases. Hair diseases are not the diseases of the hair shaft. They are diseases, they are complex diseases of the body which affect the hair follicle. And regarding the question, can modern dermatology exist without trichoscopy? I leave you with this question. And if you would like to hear more about hair diseases and about trichoscopy, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel, Professor Lydia Rudniska, where I try to post videos related to these topics. Thank you very much.